hydro is now back in nuclear, everyone who's enthusiastic has dropped off. So all the energy mix continues to change and we have 2040 and change the new goals. That's enough. This is the real. Well, no, I mean, it's a very good point. And uh, Secretary, what do you do from your perspective? You were in government at the time to take more action or companies that need to. And, and for Bob, you know, your perspective out there as, as a business person, you know, trying to do deals in a lot of these countries where, frankly, it was quite difficult to do business for the same lack of planning reasons that I think Ricardo brought up early. How do you view the role of companies in sort of navigating the position between this dual challenge or just trying to make those, those energy investments in some of these points? Well, I think as, as the Secretary said, we're trying to solve globally probably one of the most difficult systems problems you can imagine. We have to do that through coalitions working together. The role of companies, of course, there's a lot of Unfortunately, I think in many, many countries around the world, the role of business is being demonized just in general. Business is not a good thing. And actually, our role in society really has been to bring products to market, pay taxes, make investments, pay dividends to shareholders, very important. Most of the dividends, in fact, go to pension funds, often by pension fund managers, states, governments. So that's been our role, uh, and we're navigating through this. I think we have to have a purpose. Uh, people get up in the morning every day, work for big people many years, saying our role in the world is to bring deep life and to the world. I think it's now moving on further. We've got to have a even greater purpose, which I think is helping advance in the energy transition and our role in that, as well as providing energy deep life and to The society is desperately needed. Uh, there are a billion people on the planet that don't have access to electricity. You and none of you can imagine in this room even think about that. But the three billion people that cook with wood, cow dung, kerosene, and coal, not in their kitchens, in their homes, things that they cost the society of health there. So we as a, as a company, um, in the energy transition, have lots of people, resources, energy, just money, people who work in coalitions with the oil and gas industry, the other oil and gas climate initiative, and working with governments. Not everybody wants to listen. There are swaths of the public that say, uh, some say we have to solve the entire problem. I hear that. And I hear others that say you have no right to even be in the debate. It's the cause of all the problems. Of course, those are two extremes. You know, we've got to be part of this. We've got another issue as a company, and many companies will have this issue. We can move tomorrow to be, get out of oil and gas and go into renewables. I think we'd be around for about five years, pension funds, all the things. And we've got to, our role is also to create a greater return on investment. We'll be able to we'll be able to exist. So getting the right balance, and I can think out of 20, 25, 30 years, we're going to have to manage a return in cash flows as businesses transition, just like many companies have done in the United States. A great example would be Microsoft. They went from computers, operating systems, and now they're the sailor of, of services in a completely different way. That's how I think about the role of companies in this energy transition. Um, we've got to have the spirit to do that, and as the Secretary said, and I think Ricardo said, every country is different. You cannot, we talk about this in a grand macro scale, but actually how it works in every country, as you said, is difficult around the world, we do not transactions, we do relationships, we work in many countries all around the world. So that's the way it's really challenged. How do you balance complex things through coalitions, government policy? We can't do it as a company without governments, without regulations that are well sensible regulations, uh, and without people. It's not it's not correct. Uh, that's why we do work in the expensive of the earth. We're heavily involved working with governments. Uh, we helped with the design of the European emissions trading system, uh, which people said didn't work. Well, it did work for a while after the financial crisis, but now it's working really well. And that model, you can't do a global carbon price, I don't think. I don't think you can do a global trading system. It's actually been integrated into a currency system. So you're, you're working with the Chinese government, designing their carbon trading right now. So, 
take these things, North America, Europe, China, they have a carbon price, they have regulations, and he's there, then it's going to connect with it. I'm very optimistic about this. No industry that I can think of has ever dealt with the challenges for the energy industry. Yeah, well, there's one thing I want to add, and that's really Is that clear? You were part of organizing that meeting a year ago and then the second meeting. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I thought that was the first year. It was a small group. So the first year, it was a much smaller group. And it was, uh, it was invited not just for oil and gas companies, uh, but it was also centered around investors who invest in energy and what their point of view was. And then some very experienced government officials who act in the industry came together and some state governments, investors in Europe and the US. So the first year I have to say, I felt lectured to, not by the secretary, but I felt lectured to. I mean that this was not from the Vatican. They were convenient. They wanted to learn, which was fantastic. I'm happy to do that too. Yeah, I grew up Catholic too, so I <laughs> 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 Ten of the CEOs of major energy companies were there. Uh, about ten or twelve of the largest investment funds, from BlackRock to the, the Calpers in California to some European funds, were there. Uh, and then uh, a group that uh, mediated a little bit called Switzerland, which uh, Secretary is part of it, was to make sure that we uh, we reached some sort of agreements on stakes. So all yeah. all negotiating. It was <laughs> but these three were, it was remarkable that you got this group together um, with investors who are, in my view, looking for a scenario in the publisher scenario in Paris. Of course, there's many, many, many scenarios. Um, but we put forward and signed, everybody of the CEOs and the heads of the funds actually signed a document in support of the Paris Agreement. Uh, it was in support of Evaluation on carbon needed. Carbon price turned out to be too political for some countries, believe it or not. Evaluation on carbon. And that public companies would be transparent about essentially how they allocate their capital. What are your scenarios and why are you allocating capital like that? And we can read you with resolutions. Um, but to get that group to sign it, all the CEOs, and all the legal risks in the United States, by the way. This is the most litigious country in the world, and it permits so much that people want to be open because of the So uh, the fact that these statements came out were signed, big companies, very big companies, uh, I thought it was remarkable. So, so um, because for one thing, I, I'd say the, having this happen over two years, so maybe a little aspect. So the, the Vatican, uh, uh, with the executive agency, I should say, of the University of Washington, yeah. uh, uh, pulled together a meeting that uh, had as two major constituents, Bob said, oil and gas CEOs, including, by the way, four of the American companies. Uh, I can say it's not because it's public, but Exxon Global, Chevron, Conoco Phillips, and Occidental, and then a number of other, <coughs> seven other. and major financial uh, institutions. Uh, some investors, a lot of equity investors, but a lot of also financial institutions. Uh, uh, and, and a few uh, and a handful of others. And what I think is, is interesting is that okay, the outcome of the second meeting was actually formally two statements. They are on the internet. What is interesting is that everyone who was there, there were 34 potential signatories, and everyone who could sign, for technical reasons, three of them could not sign a carbon pricing statement, what was a carbon pricing statement, a call for carbon pricing and social justice. And a second statement on corporate carbon disclosures. 
the couple parts. One is the true of dynamic is very interesting. When you're building coalitions of these types, you got to be a little bit patient. Uh, you got to get to know each other. That was the first year. The first year, you may have felt lecture in your one particular moment, I remember. You got to try to roll. But it was, I'm sorry, Bob, it was probably good that you were lecture. And you were out. And, and that was important. And then going into the second year, having found a basis of discussion, because I would say when all was said and done, there was an amazing harmony even in the first year, despite a few little eruptions. Right? That was good. You got to do that. Second year, then, uh, with our Russian aid colleagues, uh, some draft statements were sent to the participants in advance with the statement that you're not signing it, but these are, we're going to define these, and they will be available for signature. And they were refined. <laughs> they were refined. Uh, but in the end, every single person with the oil and gas and financial industry signed the oil And I think that is the kind of coalition building now that we need to keep building now. Uh, labor. It has been tremendously involved, but labor also, public letter, the AFL-CIO wrote a letter after a particular magical solution was put out. They said, hey, wait a minute, we're signing on to low carbon. But if that's your idea, displacing every worker we can think of, we're off the bus. So, you know, we might have to just, this is hard work. <laughs> I mean, I know from other kinds of uh, early, this is hard work. Yeah, I'm sorry, quick put down on coalitions because uh, I've been this theory and something called the oil and gas climate initiative for about five years. And to watch that at all, uh, 14 of the companies that produce 30% of the world's oil and gas, national oil companies as well, from China, Middle East, Brazil, and Mexico. And then companies from Europe, now the US companies. It's remarkable about what you said about patients and field new coalitions. Like when we got together and said, what should we do? I think we spent a year and a half, but they really want to do everything. We said, how do we focus? And I think that's also a practical way of people working on this thing. Focus. So we you know, you methane detection leak technology developed, put a billion dollar fund together, focus on that. So, uh, yeah, and so building so, so coalitions, first of all, within, in this case, the energy industry is important. But then building those coalitions in the other sectors will be really important. And all I'm saying is that uh, I think now, as we build these coalitions, we've got to get beyond crawling the talk to at least walking the talk. We, uh, you guys have a lot to say on these topics, and we could do this for a lot longer, but we are standing in the way of uh, this and a discussion at a reception. But I do want to let everybody uh, ask, uh, so maybe get one round of questions in. So, um, Dan Wilson, before, if you can uh, state any of your affiliation questions and formal questions. We'll take three quick ones, and then we'll try to address them uh, quickly, and then uh, we'll continue the conversation outside of the So, any questions? Hi, I'm from the local carbon capture and storage team, and I'm going to ask you about. Um, so we have a lot of great projects going on in the United States on carbon capture and storage. The OGCI has certainly helped move those. What are your thoughts about China, India, how we help get more projects going on there? Because obviously that's kind of critically important. So OGCI has identified about 130 possible projects around the world. I think the 33 of them look real. We're going to focus on six for OGCI. Uh, that's me about China and India specifically. One of them is in China. And it's led very strongly by CNPC, the Chinese National Petroleum Company, who, who seems to be really behind it and want to make this happen in a practical way around some of the refineries and industrial channels. So China seems to me like they're really in India, we've not had those discussions, uh, to be honest. In India has so many 
problem with your brother and he's providing energy. But then it's just not uh, on our focus today. What are you trying to do? I just add that um, in, in the, the, the in depth California study uh, that we did, we were surprised to find to conclude that for California to meet. 40% reduction goal by 2030, carbon capture was our third longest pole of the for both some uh, uh, NGCC plants, but also industrial plants. That's one point. Secondly, uh, we are going to have to face up. And so I think it's very important, by the way, if we could really establish this as a kind of a practical means of lowering carbon, even in the relatively near term, 2030. In the United States, I think that has a lot of spillover effects to other countries uh, doing that. But let me just also uh, say something that's not going to fade your heart. So, uh, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier carbon direct removal. So, not capture from a concentrated source, but from the air or the illicit air. The National Academy of Sciences had a report uh, recently that suggested that to reach the goals that we're talking about, we would probably need 10 billion tons per year by 2050 of carbon direct removal. Now that can have many pathways, uh, including biological, uh, which we can discuss. Uh, but let's just say, suppose you wanted to put those 10 billion tons underground sequestration per year. That would be, that would be uh, 88 billion barrels of supercritical CO2 per year, more than double the global oil okay. So, in other words, we're going to need multiple pathways, but we also got to think about scale because uh, we're going to be a big time. I, I believe we'll be we'll big time uh, uh, carbon removal. Okay, and we'll just take uh, these two together very quickly in a quick response. Sure, yeah. Andy Patterson with Environmental Business International. Dr. Lee, you do a cover story in 2011 why we still need nuclear energy. Russia, China, and India are still building it. Your colleague Jim Hansen at the top of the meeting said we can't meet the goals without a significant contribution from nuclear energy. What's the update? Hi, <coughs> Chris Knight with Argus Media. This question for Bob. Can he be on track to meet the goals in the Paris Climate Accord right now? And what is it doing uh, to get closer or get to those goals? Well, so it's very, I mean, it's interesting, the goals of Paris. So I, I personally, and imagine things back down, have a three or four times this year, looked at the goals of Paris and looked at the IPC scenarios to get to the goals of Paris out of 1,100 scenarios. Therefore, the world is going to need all fuel. It, it, it is going to be a while. Uh, so what we'll do is on our, we look at advantaged oil in the portfolio. And that has a whole lot of characters, not only economics, but carbon footprint of what we do. Uh, but there is not a roadmap, and this is what I keep saying to investors. You want us to put in an annual report about scenarios in Paris. Look yourself at the, uh, the number of scenarios in the IPCC. I think you will know better if February is going to update all those scenarios. And you need to look at a hurricane set of tracking scenarios, 48 hours. I just did this with uh, Tropical Storm from there, so over 48 hours, and it's not just online, but the number of scenarios and modeling to run for a, for a Tropical Storm is unbelievable, and we're trying to, people are asking us to model 30 years, so it's funny, are we on track? I think we're doing all the right things and focusing on the right things. Um, you, need to, you need to get to the direction. I think there's a quadrant ahead of the ground. I'd like to just add, uh, uh, again, folks in the United States more that uh, the electricity sector is an easier one uh, than the fuel sector, uh, but it's 
very early, even yesterday, I can do uh, a, a whole bunch of U.S. utilities are now committed to some version of low to no carbon uh, by, uh, by 2050 and, and are making serious progress towards that. I'm only for the transparency of Southern companies, and a Southern company is already 37%. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of progress in that sector. I'm new here. Uh, yeah, new here. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, 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 committed to the idea that new here uh, can be a very, very big part of the solution. Uh, but uh, in the United States, I have to say, I, I don't count the southern borders. I said, building the two plants in Georgia.